Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Daniel Moreland. I'm the uh, current proprietor of the Venerable Dory Shop um, for the last, oh, uh, 12 years or so. I'm captain of the Pick and Castle over there. We've got a rigging um, outfit and a sail making outfit. And uh, we run the Bozen School too, which is a land based um, marine skills training program for young people, which we do whenever we can. And we're doing one this summer, and it's a uh, and it's it comes over here and they help well, hopefully they help help build a dory too so it's uh, but yes the dory shop is my uh, my uh, my baby for now this building is it's pretty old but this was originally uh, a fish store now this area here which we'll go outside and look around has been a small shipyard a shipyard since the 1880s which is a really long time ago since 1917 and this was a this was a fish store now a fish store is not a store you buy fish from. It's a place you store fish because the fishing schooners uh, with cod would, would catch the cod, pretty big size. They got them, um, split them, and, and they would put them in salt, coarse salt, and they would be called slack salted or green salted. And But that wasn't done. They were going to be dried salt cod, but they'd bring them ashore. They'd tie up, and, the, and you can see in the old videos, they'd, they'd put a dory on the dock and they'd rinse the the, the codfish off again, and then they, I think they salted them again. But they put them on flakes, and, and flakes were like waist high lattice work, all, and you see it everywhere. And they would dry them. And this would take some days to dry. So they'd flip them over, dry them, dry them. It's a lot of work, labor intensive. But at night, they had to bring them all in their fish store. They stored fish in a fish store, sometimes nets and stuff upstairs. So this would be packed high with salt cut. Then tomorrow, they'd take it all out again. An enormous amount of work goes into salt cut. And salt cod's actually really good, if you can get it. So this was a fish store. 1917, this was established as a dory shop. Now, people that know more about this than I do tell me there were three dory shops in town, but also at, you know, in the 20s and 30s, and these became sort of vertically integrated industries. In other words, if you had your fleet of ships or schooners or draggers, whatever, you tied up your dock and your warehouse would be your workshop and, and it'd all be... And the, the, the slipway was cooperative, but everything else was very much, you did it in your own company, including building doors. So a lot of the companies built their own doors, my understanding. But there were three, according to knowledgeable sources, you know their names, uh, there were three dory shops in town. In fact, between the coast of New England, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, uh, Newfoundland, there were hundreds, if not thousands, of dory shops um, up and down the coast. This is the last one. This is the last, it's actually the last production wooden boat shop in North America that I'm aware of. By production, I mean we build boats whether we have a customer or not. There's a lot of very good custom boat shops, are really good, but we're, I think Dory Shop's the only one that actually, we build boats and we'll sell them to somebody someday. Uh, it's the only, there are a couple other Dory Shops operated and beautifully ones that operated for museums, that's night. This is a museum, it's just a working museum that sails on our own bottom. Um, so, since 1917, been building dories all the time. They had sometimes two guys or four guys working in here. Uh, and the, the other, the other uh, shed was, they, they, we'd carve out the bottoms, cut the, the patterns and the transoms and the stems and some of the things, rails, get them rough cut. And then it would come over here to get assembled here. They'd get set up right behind me. This one was built here. And then out the door they went. Now, nothing's really changed um, how we build them, except we now we used... Uh, we don't use uh, iron nails anymore. We use copper, and we use non-ferrous stuff, so it lasts a little bit longer. And we use sandpaper now, which was a, never heard of in 40 years ago. So, um, and you can also we'll paint it the color you want. I mean, you used to be able to get a dory any color you want, as long as it's buff and green. But now, if you want, we introduced this crazy radical thinking not long ago, and we all about had heart attacks. To you can paint a dory besides buff and green, and we, we got through it. But it turns out you can't without lightning cracking out of the sky. But still, most people want them this way, and it's the way I would have it. Um, they would knock out a dory, sometimes I'm told four dories a week. Uh, and they were dispensable boats. They were work boats. They get smashed to hell on the, the fishing schooners. They're brutally treated. They're, uh, they were disposable. And they weren't disposable. They might, you might get 10 years out of one. You might get a summer out of one. The way they're brutally, brutally, when they were working on dory, uh, dory schooners. They rode hard, put away wet. 
On the other hand, they can last a long time if you look after it, don't bash the hell out of it. Um, later on, the, um, the draggers use them as a certified uh, tender or lifeboat, I understand. So you saw, if you look in the 1960s, you'll see all the draggers and scallopers, they all had a dory on their after deck house. And that was a requirement. And so that kept the dory shop in business. Now it's a recreational uh, boats we built maybe 10 or 20 a year. The original Blue Nose, of course, was a dory trawler. She was a salt banker. All the racing uh, fishing schooners were salt bankers. It was a requirement of the deed of gift of the and they had to qualify, and they had to be fishing by a certain time to race by a certain time. Uh, Blue Nose, while she was an extraordinary vessel, and Blue Nose 2 is too, in terms of size and capability, when she fished, she fished like every other um, uh, dory trawler. So uh, there's some great clips in the film Captain's Courageous, which shows it quite well. Uh, but basically, the dories stack on deck. You see no thwarts in this one behind, which the seats are thwarts. And if you take them out, you can stack these pretty high. You can put a bunch of, it's called nesting them. And you could put six, eight, even 10. You see pictures of as many as 12 high. And you'd have maybe two, even four stacks of these, which is a lot. And a, 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 a 15 foot bottom, which was your standard um, trawl dory, would be a two man dory. So if you had 12 dories, that means you've automatically got 24 men on board, plus a captain, a cook, and a spare hand who sort of translates to mate. And I'm it different a little bit here and there, but basically you'd have 26, 27 people. This resulted in the rigs, you know, that gives you a lot of horsepower when it comes to handling the rig. And the big rigs evolved not just to sail well, but because they could. You know, they had all these big, strong guys and they were pretty good at this. So they, the rigs developed. And of course, there's a competitive thing. There's also, I'll get back to fishing, but there's also a if you head east to the banks, coming back is almost always to windward. And it's quite a few hundred miles, and it can be rough weather. So you need a strong vessel that can get to windward. And fishing schooners, the last few generations, say from you know the 1870s on, were, were very good sailboats. And, and very safe ones, too, um, from a certain point onward. 1880s, really. Before that, they're a little dodgy. Um, so the idea is... There were a couple different ways of fishing. One was the, the schooner would anchor on the banks with a, a rope, anchor rope instead of chain, because it was too deep, it might be 150, it might be 200 feet deep. And they would launch the dories, port and starboard, and they would uh, row away from the, the schooner. And they uh, would set trawls, and a, a tub might be several thousand, a couple thousand feet of ground line, bottom line, with uh, gangens every six feet, which is a hook. And basically it's bottom fishing, long lining. And uh, it's kind of neat because it was it it, uh, um, it was very effective, very species specific. You could pretty much, I mean, you would get some stuff you didn't want, but it wasn't uh, like you're just scooping up everything. It was you could be you could more or less target species and size with the size of hook and the bait, and that was that was pretty good. Um, you would get some sharks and stuff, and and you know skate and different things and and then halibut fishermen had a different rig and 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 different bait and i'm not too familiar with that so you might do a one tub set which would be a couple hours they work godly ungodly hours i mean it was brutal work they might start at three in the morning roll off into the sunrise and do a tub set one tub set depending on the weather they might do this you know two or three times in a day they might let the they call it soak soak the hooks a couple hours they might just you know, throw it down and pull it right back up, depending how it's fishing. But I mean, there's stories of getting 40,000 pounds in a night doing this way. That's a lot. And then, so um, I think it's important to realize that, um, you know, we look back on this as some sort of quaint, rustic way of doing things, sort of pretty old boats and isn't it cute? So first of all, it's brutal, very hard work. Uh, but it was also very much a part of the uh, industrial revolution. In other words, these are highly reproducible. These, this was about maximizing profit for the owner. Uh, guys didn't, I mean, the, the, the fishermen made a buck, but mm, not great. And um, it, it was, and I can get back to, you know, when Dory, Dory started, but it was maximizing profit 
and reproducing the mechanism, the same as Henry Ford did, the same as making, you know, guns in the 18, 1790s, was, you know, to make reproducible parts and where you can reduce the level of knowledge required, increase the productivity, and that's still going on. You know, we have apps for everything now, except for how to go to sea in a bark. Um, so it is an industrial revolutionary, uh, industrial revolution function. It just has a little bit more charm because they're wooden boats. But it was severely um, challenging work. I mean, before dory trawling, uh, they would fish off the side of the schooner, and it was called hand lining. And, you know, and so schooners are smaller then. So you'd have, say, a 60, 80 foot schooner, maybe, and they would, uh, they'd have their lines, they'd jig over the rail. And you can tell in the pictures of if it's a, it's a hand liner because they'd have these grooves in the rail because the lines would chafe and make a groove. So you have my 20 guys are all, they're jigging all in the same spot on this one schooner. And they actually fished very effectively that way. And uh, then this bright, this guy, and I think it was Marblehead, he decided that, well, geez, what if we took out a couple extra boats? And he got, they weren't dories. They were kind of like Whitehall type boats, nice heavy duty rowboats, good boats. And you put one on the starboard side, one on the port side, and they went out to some bank somewhere. I think it was the 1830s. And uh, so they were, same thing. They anchored the schooner on the bank somewhere. And he launched this boat, that boat. They put a bunch of men in each. They would go off like that. And they basically tripled their fishing area for the same amount of effort. And built a long boat, you know, a Whitehall is a lot cheaper than building a schooner. So again, it's about maximizing profit. And I don't know who it was, and I don't know where it was, but some uh, bright lad says, you know, these shore boats that we use all the time, dories, they'd be good for this. And they're not good because they're better boats than a Whitehall. They're good because you can stack them. And this is, again, that industrial revolution function. They are good boats if you know what you're doing. You can handle them. They are very seaworthy with, you know, the right way. They're not. They're very good. Um, and they're cheap to build. So, oh, this is all good for maximizing profit. Um, so then eventually, pretty quickly, someone said, that's a great idea. Buddy had a great idea with these two boats, but let's use dories instead. Because this was started out as a shore fishing boat. Flat bottom, little rocker, very easy to pull up on the beach. And they were inexpensive to build. And you could build them yourself. if you. And everyone, you know, anyone that's... A, and most people were kind of half boat carpenters anyway then. And you build your own door, you probably wouldn't even buy one. And or your, your uncle would build one, your brother would build one, who knows. So then they got into that. Dory comes, the term comes probably from a town in Portugal, which, believe it or not, sounds like Dory. But I think an interesting feature of the Dory is that if you think about it historically, and I mean ancient historically, it's the logical boat you would build if you wanted to not make a dugout. And once you figured out how to make planks, and then you wanted to keep it simple, so the sides are flat. They're not beautifully curved like a, not like a, a Viking ship, which is the same basic technique, but you know, it's straight. So if you, if you decide to make a bunch of planks out of a tree and you bend them into the shape of a boat, you kind of end up with a dory. And uh, this is actually, there's dories all around the world. Uh, Senegalese fishing boats 80 feet long are dories. A sampan in um, South China Sea is, is a dory, the way they're constructed. Sometimes a little bit more curved, but the same thing. The Hanseatic cogs out of Germany uh, and Denmark and those areas in the thousand years ago, of which they have not only replicas, but the originals, they found some in the mud. They're 90 foot dories. I mean, literally, that's exactly what they are. You look at that's a dory. It looks, you see them on the old coins, it looks ridiculous, but that's exactly what they look like big 80 foot door. Now the planks are this thick. The frames are that thick instead of like this, but it's a dory. So a dory is sort of the organic, original planked boat. <laughs>
So this is 20 feet on the bottom, about 26 foot overall. And it's built for a customer in um, Cape Breton who had a dory as a kid and just dying to have this. This is sort of our maximum uh, cabin cruiser sport fisherman dory. We're thinking about a flying bridge and uh, a jacuzzi. No, we're not. Um, this is a very fun project. Uh, it's going to be a neat boat. We've added a keel. You can see it has an, in, uh, an inboard engine, a diesel on a shaft that kind of does this. And that's been a very fun project for us. Um, so, but it's basically the hull is a, a sane dory hull. The hulls are all essentially the same, just different sizes. What's sort of interesting, I suppose, is, you know, um, sometimes people think a smaller dory should be, it's half the size, so it must be half the price. No, 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 they're, they're not half, because every plank still has two ends, regardless how long it is. So, so they don't scale down exactly, and they don't even scale up. Bigger actually isn't that much more expensive. It obviously is a little bit. So that's the same dory. That's almost done and should be going, we're going to launch at the end of the month and uh, that'll be fun. And we've got a very happy uh, customer, uh, Mike Gray, of course, built it. Fantastic craftsman and boat builder and he's been the mastermind behind this one. Um, what else we have going on? Behind that white tent is we're rebuilding a, uh, a Concordia 41, which is a German built yacht, beautifully built yacht. Uh, in the 1950s and 1960s, they built 103 of them. 102 of them are still afloat and sailing today. That's unusual. It was the last production wooden boat, or not the last, but probably the last production wooden yacht before they, tra you know, they shifted into fiberglass. A uh, beautiful boat, and that's been a project for a while. And we're going to get that wrapped up once the same dory is done. Um, we have over here there are our twin schooner waiting her happy new owner. Uh, that's a 48 foot, um, based on a tan cook design, uh, but kind of on steroids. It's, it's a little heavier, best materials. Here. There's no iron in it, it's all bronze. Um, 48 foot, a lot of tropical, like the keel is mountain gourmet, which will never rot, barely floats. And a lot of the frames are from, so the mountain, the keel is from Grenada, the frames are from, um, uh, also from Grenada and, and Bequi and Kariaku, white cedar. This was a boat that's gonna last as long as any wooden boat you can imagine. It's gonna sail really well. Dave Westergaard designed and built her in the dory shop. We built two of them. One's off headed to Norway right now. And uh, this is, I'd love to keep her, but it doesn't work that way. So fantastic boat. So we built those. And we also have a photograph of, from 1905, we think, that shows a schooner being built in the exact same spot, which we didn't know about. Uh, when we built this thing. We knew, I knew that they built a lot of boats here, but we've sort of found out since then. This was a quite a significant little uh, shipyard and it was one of the earliest uh, shipyards in Lunenburg. In fact, Lunenburg has been building vessels since basically the first year it got founded in, and in short order, like 10, 20 years after it was founded, the, the British government, sub, you know, they paid bounties. You know, it was like 10 shillings per ton, which adds up to a chunk of change. So there's nothing new about subsidizing business. You know, it's, a, it's an old, well-established uh, tradition we, we support it. Um, we're not subsidized. That's a hint. Um, but this is apparently one of the, it is the oldest continuous shipyard in Lunenburg. That's kind of, we didn't know that. Gee, that's a good question. How do we do it? I don't even know sometimes. So we have, you know, in the usual wooden boat, wooden boat magazine uh, website. Um, I think website's probably the, the thing these days. We have a story going on of new launchings. And then there's, there's, the, there's the Calanova Chronicles, which I encourage you to, that's the story of, of this schooner. It's uh, somewhat fictionalized. You'll see that when you read it. Um, she's a 26 feet on deck, but she's 138 feet below deck, and you'll find out all about that when you read the story. The Bosun School is a, um, a land-based skill sets program. We learned on Pick and Castle that we're getting a lot of crew that are highly qualified in, uh, you know, from all over the world in sort of emergency training. You know, they're good at putting out fires. This is good. First aid, great. All that stuff is great. But that's what the training had been, and they didn't know how to do stuff. And it's critical you know how to do stuff. And so we figured, well, let's teach how to do stuff. 
So we take what we've done on Picnic Castle on a year voyage and compact it to four months, just the skills, not the seafaring, the watch keeping, not the dishwashing, just the skill sets, and cram it into four months, <coughs> which isn't enough, but it's a lot. And we splicing rope, splicing wires, splicing hawsers, learn how to caulk, learn how to paint a big ship. That's actually a skill. It's not just getting your toothbrush out. It's uh, uh, how to moor a vessel. And then we spend, then there's a big small boat component. We're finding that highly qualified mates with large tickets couldn't handle the skiff. Now, that's not their fault. They weren't, and when I was coming up, that's how you got your mate's job is because you were good at the small boat. And and this sort of ties into this ties into the dory shop because we also bring them over here to mess around with boats big small boat component and usually we build a dory with them and the idea is not that they become dory builders but you take a stack of lumber and two weeks later you row a boat away that opens your mind to the possibilities and that is a profound experience they're not technical boat builders, but they said, gee, you can bend this, you can cut this, this goes that way. Wow, I could do this. It opens up the mind, and then that, that has a real positive impact later on if they go seafaring. So we're doing a boat and school session this summer. It's usually three to four months long. We've placed a lot of crew, including on the Blue Nose. We've got, I think, six boat and school graduates on the Blue Nose, and to other vessels, to tugboats, to yachts, yacht deliveries. Yacht delivery this week is going with two boats and school crew. And it also builds their passion, because if you know what you're doing, it's easier. And if you know what you're doing and it's easier, it's more fun, which means you do it more. So one of the things for Bowdoin School is that the young people that come out of it will stay longer in industry or yachts or whatever it is they're doing. It's not, it's not a credential program. We're not, you know, we don't, don't give a certificate. You have to get that somewhere else. But it makes you, it, 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 fl it, it fans the flames of your passion for boats, which in turn makes you a better crew member. Well, that's good. So it's also a lot of fun. And you see the summer, they'll be messy. We had like half a dozen boats between dugouts and canoes and little sloops, and that blue boat. This one, the Calanova, is sort of their, it's their Cadillac. And so they'll have to shine this up, painter, caulker. It's not just sailing. You know, if you're gonna have a puppy, you gotta feed the puppy and clean the puppy. And, and so they'll paint this, they'll launch her, they'll put the rig in, they'll bend the sail. We'll have instruction sail around, and then we'll reverse the process at the end of the year. And that is very deep and informative. And how to do it quickly and efficiently and effectively so you're not doing it for the rest of your life. You know, it doesn't take forever to do this. It's also not rocket science. So we try to transfer that stuff. And also, if you sort of step back, I mean, how did I get start, start in, you know, in boats and ships as well? The, the waterfront was open. You could come down and muck about. There's always a piece of junk boat someone would give to you for five bucks and you'd patch it up and you'd have fun and that was your start. That's very difficult today. So we're, in, we're combining Picton Castle's deck experience with the idea, the notion of you come down, mess around on the waterfront, something good will happen. And that's, what, that's where the dory shop really comes in. And you know, we don't have a gate. We don't have barbed wire. We don't have chain link. You know, our insurance guy doesn't like that, but it's what we do. Well, I'm, I'm a, a, both a friend and admirer of, of Captain Phil Watson. Um, he's an amazingly gifted and capable master of mariner. He, he's just, you know, he's one of the best in the world. And he's one of the best in the world, and one of the ships that's one of the best ships in the world. There's two ships I point to as penultimate vessels in terms of everything they do and how they do it. One is Blue Nose, the other is the full rig ship Denmark. And they're the best. One's the best square rigger, one's the best schooner. I would say that my relationship started, it was Blue Nose that got me here with Pick and Castle. It was her shiny masts and the fact that she was brought here and I did a restorative, I was involved with the restoration of a couple of fishing schooners. That brought me here in the 80s and 90s, and uh, I thought, well, let's, if I ever do my own ship, we'll do it here. And that's worked out very well. Um, but the race relationship is, is uh, I'd say, well, it's collegial. It's very, you know, it's very friendly. Uh, there were very different ships, very different programs, but the basis is all very much the same. Professional seamanship, and no one gets hurt. And, uh, and then there's a fair amount of showtime 
with both ships. We spend a lot of time in the public eye, you know, tall ship events, and, and that means you can't screw up, among other things. Um, there's sort of a lot of jokes about that, tall ship events. Um, but Blue Nose is, and I don't know if every, I think not enough people understand it, she is an Eiffel Tower. She is a Statue of Liberty. You know, she is Big Ben. She is the Tower of London. She is um, the Grand Tetons. I mean, she's a very major uh, architectural icon of, of Canada. And she's known throughout the world. And, um, and she sails. And she gives people a real experience to varying degrees. The crew get one thing. The people that visit get another. And, you know, the people that sail her, it's something else. They'll never forget it. Um, I think what she's doing this summer is fantastic. You know, sailing around the province, show her under sail. You don't need to sail on her to see this. And the, I think I'm, I'm, what I understand is that the response has been huge. And it's like, it's like this is very exciting. Because I've never, I, I've seen Pick and Castle under sail once. I'd love to see her under sail. That'd be cool. But seeing Blue Nose under sail and being handled well and not just trying to carry, I mean, it's great that she can take passengers. That's beautiful. But seeing her under sail is, is, is thrilling. And there's a lot to be proud of there. And it's that pride that pulls us forward. It's not pride in the past, it's pride in the abilities of today and opens your minds for the future. Because if it was all only about the past, well, that's cool, but maybe that's the future's where we're headed. We're not headed backwards. So that, there's great value in that. And she's an amazing ambassador. Um, but an ambassador to do an ambassador's job has to be away. Mm -hmm.